for skidding and sliding in your way here today. It's kind of nice to see the snow. We say that now, but no. next month at this time, when we've had it five times, we're not going to like that. Um, I'm going to read to you the call of worship, and then we'll get into announcements a little bit later. The call to worship is from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Be still and know that I am God. Mm. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Please stand. Joyful, joyful. Joyful, joyful, we adore the God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts are full like flowers before thee, till the as the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark up now away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All the Thank you, praise team. That's beautiful. And sitting in the front, which I rarely do, I get to hear all your voices yeah. behind. It's just awesome. Thank you. Um, you have announcements in your bulletin, and if you're over the age of six, I'm sure you can read. So um, I'll let you do that. But there are a couple of things I'd like to highlight. Uh, number one, of course, special thank you to Rick Porter for coming and preaching today. Um, Pastor Tim Voth and Sharon are in Breckenridge, Minnesota for a 30-year celebration. 
I have one question for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How was the border crossing this morning? You know, Rick has relocated since the last time he was here. Yeah. He's no longer in this state. So well, how'd the crossing a, go? As you know, I lived in Canada for many years. So comparatively, the border crossing was easy. <laughs> we are glad to hear that. Maybe not as easy as the southern border, but let's not go there. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and we want to extend a sincere thank you to Carol Banta for her coordination of the Operation Christmas Child update. As of today, or a couple of days ago, we had 85 boxes ready to go. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Kathy Anderson, who is going to be undertaking that new endeavor. Thank you very much. Hey, Pastor Voth resumes the Lunch Bunch uh, this week. You're going to be studying the book of Esther, and that's uh, in the fellowship room right here. Um, also, uh, we have a prayer request for um, Joe Salmon. Uh, if you're in this community, you know that he was accidentally shot. Hmm. We don't know all the details exactly and the accuracy of what we've been hearing maybe on the street, but. Um, we want to ask you for your continued prayers for him. Mm -hmm. There is a benefit for Joe that's going to be held. This is short notice. It's tomorrow from three, from, excuse me, 5 to 8 p.m. at the Taco House. So please join and support that family if you can. And also a reminder that, remember, fall back. So next week, please turn your clocks back. This next Saturday, thank you very much. 7.30. At Perkins. Thank you, Ron. Are there any other announcements that may not have been in the bulletin? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Please stand and join me in the responsive reading. It's from Romans 3, verses 19 through 28. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, Therefore no, one no one will be declared, declared righteous, righteous in his sight by observing, by observing the, law. the law. Rather, through, through the, the law, law we, become we become conscious, conscious of sin. sin. But the righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had, he had left, left the, the sins, sins committed beforehand, beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where, Where then is, is the boasting? boasting? It, it is, is excluded. excluded. On, on what principle? principle? On, on that, that of observing the law? law? No, but, but on that of faith. Of faith. For, For we maintain, maintain that, a that a man is justified, justified by faith apart from observing the law. the law. Amen. Especially this Reformation Sunday. Amen. That's the message of Reformation Sunday. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age. He stands, and time is in 
team. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl told me this is the first time she's done this. I thought she did great, didn't she? Yeah. Good you? Yeah. I, I told her I'd give her a little bit of a hard time. Was, was the lectern a little high for her? Okay. Short shaming. Stop that. Cheryl and I worked together for lots of years at the Bible conference, and we survived one another. And now that we don't work together anymore, we enjoy one another. So, so that's good. It's fun to be at Harbor. Uh, you, Cheryl was right. You, you sang well, and I could hear you too, and my hearing's going. Um, and also, I always sense that you live out the joy of your name. And I don't think this many people could fake that all at once. So I think it's real. You're a joyful church, and I sense that. And it makes it easy to come here and fun to come here. And so thanks to Pastor Tim for uh, inviting someone from Minnesota now, <laughs> of all places, to come back to this place where we lived for 18 years and uh, that we love. We love the area. We, we love the state. But um, when, I, when I used to... Uh, preach in Minnesota, I would tell them that God called me to be a missionary to Iowa. But, but that was totally a joke. God really has called me to be a missionary to Minnesota. So we're doing okay up there, and Diane sends her greetings, and it's uh, great to be with you. And what better place to be than in a Lutheran church on Reformation Sunday? And so I'm happy uh, to be with you on this particular day. Your worship folder has a, a well-done paragraph about Reformation Sunday. And because I came thinking, you know, there might be some folks who don't even really know about this Sunday, but I'm going to back away from saying some of that because you have already read it, or if you're older than six, isn't that what was, what was said earlier? <laughs> You've already read it, right? Uh, after Luther took his stand, and after he was called on the ecclesiastical carpet 
for his stand. Um, he was under duress, and friends took him away to the castle at Wartburg uh, for his protection. And he, he uh, grew a beard, changed his appearance, changed his clothing, uh, so that he would not be easily recognized even in that fairly remote place. And he was opposed by both flesh and spirit. We all know the legend of the tormenting demon that uh, came to him and at which Luther was to have tossed his inkwell. Now, most people believe this is myth, that it didn't really happen. There were uh, purportedly ink stains on the walls at the Wartburg Castle from the inkwell hitting the wall. Uh, but interestingly enough, ink stains started showing up in lots of places around Germany uh, uh, to kind of perpetuate the story. Uh, a fellow by the name of Scott Hendricks, who's a Reformation scholar, and I'm just going to quote him directly here. He says all about that incident, although definitely a fabrication, this legend points to an important truth about Luther. I like that he's redeeming the potential falseness of the story. He was a deeply devout man of his age who believed strongly in the existence of the devil. The Christian life was a constant battle against the devil who was behind every evil act and disaster. Christians needed to pray every day, coached Luther in his catechism, that God would forgive their sins and strengthen their faith so they could survive this struggle. The reformer spoke from experience even though he trusted that God would finally defeat the devil. He was also subject to the attacks of doubt and spiritual despair. If Luther did once launch an inkwell at his most dreaded adversary, he would not have been acting out of character. He maybe didn't toss the ink, but the battle was on. And Luther knew the battle was on. And we can only imagine people who stand in pivotal places in the history of God's work in the world, people who stand in such pivotal places are opposed. Outwardly, perhaps, overtly, in manifest ways, perhaps, but surely inwardly, in the struggles of faith and the doubts and the wonderments and even the fears that can sometimes come. So it's no wonder that eight years later, Luther wrote the words, we'll sing them at the end of our service today, one verse of which is, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed, his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not at him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. And then this concluding line, one little word shall fell him. I want to bring you a little word today. And I'll, I, the battle I'll fight all day is to keep it little enough. Uh, to, to fit in our time frame, one little word from the Word of God, from the book of Romans, which was instructive to Luther in his uh, work. We've already read from it today. Uh, and that word is in verse 20 of Romans 16. The God of all peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. That's the little word I want to bring to you today. I, I don't know what Luther, in fact, no one knows what Luther meant by one little word. Some have said it's the name of Jesus, and we sang of that today. Uh, my friend, uh, my Canadian musician friend, Brian Dirksen, did a rewrite of uh, Martin Luther's uh, uh, Mighty Fortress, and he said, one little word from God's word. So he essentially said, any scripture, the word of God, may be used to stand against the wiles of the devil. But I come today with this little word which has come for me over the years, and I trust for you today to encourage you in the world in which we live. Polarized, warring, warring in this week and the last couple of weeks in ways that it hasn't recently. Uh, decaying, dare I say that? Even the politicians are saying we live in a declining country, and then they argue about that, which is par par part of the proof of the reality. Uh, where we choose up sides and fight furiously on social media, 
uh, or we press for political or judicial or military uh, solutions. And then there are the, some of us who, who long for the church to remain unchanged and just be a safe little haven to which we can run in this world. And I'm here to say in the middle of all that, our battle, even as Luther had his battles, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. I don't know if that's the verse from which Luther drew that verse in his great hymn, but uh, the truths are the same if the source was different. Let me read a few verses from Romans 16 as our scripture reading today. Romans 16, 17 to 20. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. You know, I watched a particular Christian pastor. He, he, he has some ads on TV that are appearing now and then. And I won't name him because I don't pick on people publicly. But, uh, you know, he was, he's just too slick by half. You know, there are preachers that we see, and there's a reality about them, an authenticity. This guy comes on, and, and the first word that comes in my mind is uh, greasy and slimy, and I'm not sure that's fair. But uh, Paul's saying, watch out for these people. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Verse 19, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Mighty God, I simply ask for that which has been promised and given, the grace of our Lord Jesus. For me, as I stand before your people, for your people as they're gathered to worship you on this special day, for Pastor Tim, as he's away from us this morning, for anyone from this flock who is unable to be with us today, for the wider church across the world where Christ is exalted as God, we ask that you will pour out unusual grace on Reformation Sunday 2023. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Over 20 years ago, I was pastoring a church in Canada, as I mentioned earlier, unexpectedly, when, when border cross, crossings were referenced. I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, I was pastoring a church in Canada. I did it for eight years. We lived there for uh, 10 years. And we began to experience dramatic opposition. I know in my previous times with you, I've shared some of those stories. And I, I'm fighting how far to go into actual stories, but it, it got so heavy and so dark. Teen suicides. Teen suicides. Uh, uh, six of them in our community of 120,000 back then. It's grown since then. Um, three of them in our church. Drug overdoses. Auto accidents. Uh, I hate to say it, it's a little macabre, but in my life and some of you through what you've done professionally, I have morgue images in my mind of standing with parents over the body of a child and identifying that body. And some of you have done that too, and you know it kind of etches in your mind. There were overt manifestations of the demonic. Uh, I, I know I've told you of a few, maybe not this one. I recall a man sitting in the front row. This is back when we had Sunday evening services, and uh, he was... Uh, he was hissing at me and said, Porter, we hate you. We're going to kill you. And, uh, and first off, I go, wow, who knew plural pronouns are not a new thing? <laughs> and kind of gives you a hint where they might be sourced. Uh, we hate you. We're going to kill you. Now, it didn't frighten me. I, you know, uh, don't, I don't tell you that. It just was a thing that was happening, a thing that was happening. We could debate the theology of it. Leaders were being physically afflicted and dying. 
Even I was bearing in my body a cancer that wasn't discovered until I moved to this area, and by God's grace and praying physicians and dear friends, uh, that was dealt with. Deep divisions on our large staff. One pastor who I loved, respected, he was a teammate, and yet I kind of knew that there was murkiness surrounding him. And now I've learned only in the last week, I don't know how this came to me, I learned that he's, he's, uh, he's found new heights of spirituality through magic mushrooms. And he has a website called Psychedelic Jesus, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I, I permit him his freedoms to be who he is. I don't want him flying my airplane based on uh, the events of this week. He, he, uh, he's gone off the rails. We had that going on in so many ways and in so many places. So in the middle of the mess, the mess in Western Canada, uh, this Bible verse was driven to my heart and repeated. And you know what? Don't you love the short Bible verses? I do. You know, Psalm 119 is about the Word of God, but who could quote the whole thing? I mean, maybe someone present could, but I couldn't. Um, It's wonderful when there's a pithy statement in God's word. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So I offer it to you today for the challenging times in which we live. And my heart cry is that it will be a prophetic word, that it will be established. I'm not a teaching preacher. Nobody's ever accused me of that. I like those people. I learn from them. I'm a, I'm a preaching preacher who wants to say, believe that God, just by speaking the word, will establish it by faith in a people, and even beyond this place, to our region and to our world. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. John Piper points out that this is the only mention of Satan in the book of Romans. I didn't know that until John taught me. When Paul, I'm quoting him, finally mentions the devil, he has one thing to say about him, and then Piper quotes Luther, his rage we can't endure, for lo, his doom is sure. Paul has one sentence to say about Satan in 16 chapters. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's all. He gets one mention, and the mention is he's doomed you will crush him under your feet. So here's the takeaway for today. In the divided and confused and even violent times, take heart, the triumph of good over evil is secure. Be encouraged. When we are walking with a good God through His revealed way, we are secure in uh, His grace through our faith for these times. We can And you see the title in the worship folder. We can march through the mess with peaceful assurance. So let me grab three observations. Here's the first one. The God of peace is a crusher. (laughs) Who would expect that? What a striking contrast. The loving God of peace is prepared to crush that which opposes him, that which destroys those whom he loves, that which is false. I came across this the other day, or it may have come to me through, one, through a meme. Never make the mistake of assuming the person of peace is unskilled at war. Our God of peace is not unskilled at war. He will protect his name. It's very important. That's why we call God jealous. It's very important that he protect who he is, because who he is is what holds all things together. The God of peace will crush Satan, but he may do that in ways that are very hurtful to that which opposes him, destructive. The word is uh, soon tribo, to break into pieces, to break down, to crush, to bruise. King James says uh, bruise. The newer versions say crush. To break the power of anyone, to debilitate. The image is a military image. And when good and evil are at stake, when God's love for his created order is at stake, when justice is at stake, 
The God of peace is a crusher, crushing the enemy who came against him in prideful rebellion. I suppose I date myself. In, in the age of the chosen movies, I date myself by referring to the Passion of the Christ. But there's a scene in the Passion of the Christ uh, which, um, which came to me in this Romans 16:20 season. Uh, I had been invited to a preview of, of the movie at a Christian school auditorium. It was long before it was released in theaters. Mel Gibson's movie, and you know, Mel Gibson, a Catholic. Uh, you recall the imagery was intense because he was very focused on the suffering of Christ. Um, and as I was invited to this school, the elders called me and said, we want to meet with you this morning. I said, I can't, i got to go to a movie, and that, which didn't go over really well. But, um, but I knew what they were voting on. They were voting on whether to ask for my resignation or fire me or whatever we call it now in the church. And so I went to the Passion of the Christ. And I was communing with God during the movie. And he was comforting me as Jesus suffered. And, uh, and, and then came this scene, and maybe you recall it, and we could have shown it, but I didn't choose to do that today. Uh, then came this scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is in agony, you know, sweating great drops of blood. And there is this murky figure on the periphery, played by Tilda Swinton, as if maybe God made her just to play that part, I'm not sure, because she fit. Androgynous, menacing, attempting to woo Jesus to want that cup to pass from him. And then out of her robe comes a serpent. Now understand, this didn't happen. There is no record that this happened. But, but Gibson was imagining the battle. And the serpent comes slithering out of her robes toward him. And it's a frightening, it's a menacing moment. It's unsettling. And it approaches the weeping, weakened, agonizing Jesus. And then Jesus stands to his feet. And remember, I'm watching this in a season of suffering. Jesus stands to his feet, and in a sudden, unexpected movement, the Prince of Peace crushes the head of the serpent with the heel of his sandaled feet. So fragile, so broken, so grieved, and suddenly he's the crusher. There's no biblical record that this happened, but it appears that Gibson was attempting to Connect the Garden of Eden with the Garden of Gethsemane according to Genesis 3.15, the curse after the sin of Adam and Eve. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman Eve, and between her offspring, which is Jesus and us, your offspring and hers, her offspring is Jesus and us, and he, her offspring, Jesus, will crush Satan, the serpent in the garden, your head. And, you know, we could argue there's nowhere in the Bible that says the serpent in the garden was Satan, but it seems that that's who it was. I think all of Scripture seems to point to that. Mel Gibson certainly saw it as that. And you will strike his heel. Jesus is going to smash you, and you're only going to bite him. He's going to destroy you, and you're only going to wound him. The short version of all of that is found in 1 John 3.8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Rick, why are we going into all this? Because I want to encourage you that when you watch too much news or when bad things, even bad accidents like this young man here in Milford, when bad things happen in our world, they are not the last word. When bad things happen to us, they are not the last word. They're a part of God's story in which we are privileged to have a part and it will come out to the glory of God and the good of all that God loves. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. Here's the next point. God's a crusher. Who knew? Next point. Actually, we're the crushers. He will crush Satan under our feet as our feet become weapons of judgment on evil in this world. 
his truth, Luther wrote, to triumph through us. And our weapons, though, are not fleshly. You know, Gibson showed it as a physical crushing, but the reality is we're not really called to military power or political power. I mean, that may be an individual's calling, but we as the church are called to what I'll say is Jesus' power, the power of humility, the power of suffering, the power of loving. Paul wrote it this way, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So even in an age when we're tempted to try to be mighty, powerful, angry, ugly, to crush evil, the invitation is to be loving, to be gentle, and to look like Jesus. On mission with our beautiful feet, according to Isaiah 52. In prayer and worship, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, 2 Samuel, and I am saved from my, my enemies. Uh, and then uh, fleeing evil, Psalm 119, 101. Uh, hey, there's Psalm 119. I, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. In choosing our friends, Proverbs 110. If sinners entice you, do not consent. Do not walk in the way with them, for their feet run to evil. By putting on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, including the shoes that are the, the, the gospel, for the gospel of peace. We're to wear our peace boots as we march peacefully through the mess by remaining humble as Jesus did, even washing the feet of those who were about to forsake him. And then, and I love this one, and it's good for harbor with laughter and lightheartedness. I sense it from you today. All the days, Proverbs 15, 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. We get to choose. As I just said to maybe Cheryl today as we were talking of a friend, happiness is an inside job. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for a season. To that end, the Apostle Paul follows up his statement of the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, with this statement, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And it's not the benediction yet. We're going to pray the benediction of Romans 16 as we conclude today. But before the benediction, he gives this little interjection. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What's he saying? I think he's saying you'll need a whole lot of grace to live this well, to crush after the heart of Christ in a world where evil seems to be on the rise. And then lastly, the crushing is soon. The God of all peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. It seems odd. The wording is future when in reality, the crushing, even as Mel Gibson understood, was at least initiated in Christ's death and resurrection. But Paul seems to refer to the final consummation, when, when the process will be totally completed and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire which burns forever. John Piper summarizes, Satan has been decisively defeated in the death and resurrection of Christ. He is being defeated now by Christ through Christians who speak the word of God and put on the whole armor of God and I would also say do the works of Christ himself. And he will finally be vanquished and thrown into the lake of fire never to deceive or torment the world began again. But if that's true, to those of us who are bound by our short lives, 6,000 years or 2,000 years does not seem soon. So we are questioning. And Peter says in the last days people will come and they'll say, hey, you know, you guys keep talking about Jesus coming soon and you keep talking about uh, maybe this verse, the God of peace soon crushing Satan. And it's kind of been going on forever, and we don't think it's even true. And Peter says, well, you know, we're, for God, a day's like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. He's not bound by time. We are. And moreover, he says, um, he says God's passion, compassion longs that all would come to repentance. So, so um, God isn't willing that any be destroyed except the destroyer who destroys his beloved. And, and so soon, uh, maybe soon on a divine timetable, but let me also say soon may mean 
your next marching moment. I like this. This came as an encouragement to me out of the text. Soon may mean your next marching moment. When you leave church today, you may have opportunity to walk like Jesus and in so doing to crush the head of the serpent through acting out the very heart of Christ for people. Loving the unlovely, being gentle and kind and patient, giving a kind word to turn away wrath. As we leave the church today, let's understand that we're going out to crush the head of Satan, but it's not a violent act. It's a gentle act to every person with whom we engage. And so for that, I don't know about you, but I, I can mess up in that area sometimes a moment of anger, a moment of reaction. So here's what we pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us. May he be with us in that. And then the crushing will be completed. I won't take time to read all this, but you go to Revelation chapter 20, and you see that according to John's apocalyptic vision, Satan is cast uh, down and destroyed, and then he's uh, uh, there's a period of uh, that is characterized as a thousand years, a period of uh, the reign of God and beauty and the restoration of the kingdom. And then he's released for a little while again. And then it says, he and the false prophet, the beast, are thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, and they will be tormented day and night forever. The crushing will be completed. So soon... May not feel soon in our terms, but in God's terms, I think we can call it soon because his terms are eternal. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet as we persist in living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, we, I'll close with a story. And uh, if that clock's right, we're doing great, which is probably because they gave me a lot of time which is probably because I've been here before. Uh, <laughs> so they know. Whoever's in charge of the clock knows. We can take heart in our messy times as Luther did as he marched ahead in peace, crushing evil with every Christian act. Here's the story. You know, I don't know if I've ever had a sermon where I so struggled with what to do at the end. Uh, I've had three different endings to this sermon, but I'll not use all of them, just this one. Corrie Ten Boom, in her book, Tramp for the Lord, tells a story. It's when she was traveling, speaking, telling the stories of her Holocaust survival, her hiding of the Jews in Harlem in the Netherlands, a place where uh, Diane and I have privileged to visit, and maybe many of you as well. And she would meet people. When she was in Africa speaking, she met Thomas, a tall black man who lived in a hut together with his big family. He loved the Lord, and he loved people. His neighbor lived across the dirt street, and his neighbor hated God and hated men like Thomas who loved God. Now, I want to stop and just say, this is, this is a micro-application. This is one guy's story told by Corey Ten Boom. I don't doubt her veracity. I'm sure it's true. But we might say, well, what's that got to do with me? I say, I say it's a macro metaphor, a macro metaphor for the world in which we live. And what this man does, as you'll hear in a moment, is a picture of what God is doing and what he's doing through us as we take these stands in difficult times. Thomas's neighbor lived across the dirt street, hated men like Thomas. The hatred grew stronger and stronger. Do we see any of that today? until the man began sneaking over at night and setting fire to the straw roof on Thomas's hut, endangering Thomas's children. Three nights in a row this happened, and each time Thomas was able to rush out of his hut and put out the flames before they destroyed the roof and the walls. The fact that he had never said an unkind word to his neighbor made his neighbor hate him even more. One night, the neighbor sneaked across the street and set fire to Thomas's roof. This night, however, a strong wind came up, and as Thomas rushed to beat out the fire, the sparks blew across the street and set the neighbor's house on fire. Thomas, now, right there, if that was me, I would uh, quick try to cut the phone lines, hide the fire extinguishers, and laugh at the guy. That's what my tendency would be. Thomas finished 
putting out the fire on his roof, that's interesting, and then rushed across the street to put out the fire on his neighbor's roof. He was able to extinguish the flames, but in the process he badly burned his arms and hands. Other neighbors told the chief of the tribe what had happened. The chief was so furious that he sent his police to arrest the neighbor, throw him in prison. That night, Thomas came to the meeting where Corey Ten Boom was speaking, as he had done every night. She noticed his hands and uh, uh, arms were so badly burned and said, what happened? And he told her the story. And Corey said, maybe like we would have, it's good that this man is now in prison. Now your children are no longer in danger, and he cannot try to put, your, put your, uh, house in flames. Thomas said, that is true, but I am sorry for that man. He's an unusually gifted man, and now he must live together with all those criminals in a horrible prison. Corey said, then let us pray for him. She did the work of Jesus. She was doing a crushing work, but it was not with hateful weapons. Thomas dropped to his knees and holding up his burned and bandaged hands, he began to pray, Lord, I claim this neighbor of mine for you. Lord, give him his freedom and do the miracle that in the future he and I will become a team to bring the gospel in our tribe. Amen. Now, isn't that amazing? God is able to do exceeding abundantly of all that we ask or think. Thomas, and I've had this experience personally with African people of faith. Maybe, Patty, maybe you have too. Uh, uh, a simplicity of culture that is not afraid to pray the big prayer and to even take it beyond what we might consider, consider normal or understandable. When I ask, uh, never had I heard such a prayer, Corey Ten Boom says. Two days later, I was able to go to the prison. I spoke to the prisoners about God's joy and God's love. And among the group who listened intently was Thomas's neighbor. When I asked who would receive Jesus, that man was the first one to raise his hand. You know, I, I know there's a tendency in our unbelieving world to say, oh, this can't be true. I'm telling you, Corey Ten Boom didn't make stuff up. Corey Ten Boom lived by faith. After the meeting, I told the neighbor how Thomas loved him, how he had burned his hands trying to put out the fire to save the neighbor's house, how he had prayed that they might become a team to spread the gospel. The man wept big tears and nodded his head saying, yes, yes, that is how it shall be. The next day I told Thomas, he praised God and said, you see, God has worked a miracle. We never can expect too much from him. He left running off down the path, his face beaming with joy. We live in painful times, difficult times, challenging times, confusing times. But the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. And as we do works like these, and Jesus said it, greater works than these you shall do. As we do works like these in love, in forgiveness, in faith, God will be pleased to do miracles. And I can't tell you what will happen in the macro context, but by this story, I think I can stand in agreement that in micro context, lives will be changed. And when lives are changed, generations are changed. So I invite you to that. So let me say this as I uh, take a seat and Cheryl comes to lead us in the creed. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Our little word for today, the God of all peace shall soon crush Satan under our feet. tried to hide that microphone from me. Oh, I sorry. See. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm, uh, I should have brought my peach crate, I guess, to stand on. Your what? My peach crate. Oh, your peach crate. I'll get you one. I used to, um, when I was a child in the school I went to, um, uh, I had to serve lunch. I was helping to serve the lunch line as a child, and I could never my job was to serve the bread with tongs, and I could never reach over the counter, so they always brought in a peach crate for me to stand on. So, uh, pray with me the Lord's Prayer, please. 
Thank you, Rick, for that message. Thanks, Cheryl. Our Father, Father who, art who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let's recite together the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remain standing. In a moment, we're going to sing Luther's great hymn, which, in, interestingly enough, and some of you have probably experienced this, is found in many, perhaps most, of the Catholic hymnals. That even though Luther was, was crossways with uh, the practices of the church in 1517, when he took his stand, uh, nevertheless, this hymn, which I think is the only hymn that's ever popularly utilized, uh, nevertheless resides yet in the pews of the various uh, Catholic churches of at least our nation and perhaps around the world. Uh, our good sayings, you know, I told you the apostle had the, he had the pre-benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, but then he had the real benediction. And it's the last few verses of Romans chapter 16. So let's keep our eyes up, our heads up. I speak it over you as the word of God uh, as we go out. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. We're only going to do four verses and not the 25 verses today. <laughs> Oh. 